I do. Right. Last section for this evening. Here we go. Matty had had an adventure too. She had seen, she had left the nest in the heat of the afternoon and had set off to explore the hedgerow. It had been raining and the heat of the sun was bringing all manner of delicious smells out of the damp earth. Because she was not really hungry, she tasted a lot of things that would not normally have interested her. She nibbled, nibbled some fungus from the roots of a tree. She gnawed an oak apple and she bit off the shoot of a young nipple which she spat out because she did not like its bitter taste. She did not move quietly. Hedgehogs do not make any attempt to hide the sound of their movements. A man called Jack Belton was on his way home from work and heard her rustling in the hedgerow. He soon found her and scooped her up in his handkerchief, thinking she would be useful to have in his garden. He carried her to his house, which was next door to the bread and milk house, and put her in a dished used hen coop with a saucer of milk. When she found herself fastened in the hen coop, Matty felt very frightened. Her back muscles contracted and she curled up into a prickly ball which looked like the husk of a sweet chestnut. Jack Belton laughed and called his young son to see the fuzz peg the name given to hedgehogs in Devon. It was the first time that Matty had completely rolled up and she was very surprised and proud. She could not stay curled up for long. Her muscles were still too weak and she had not yet learned the trick of breathing sideways through the woolly hair of her stomach, but she felt very clever and grown up. Even though she had to uncurl after a minute or two, that same evening, Jack Belton was bragging in the Cardiff Arms, saying that he had caught a young fuzz pig for his garden and shut it up in the hen coop. But when he got home, the milk had gone, and so had Matty. She had wriggled through the bars of Bolton's hen coop and ran back to the nest. At the end of the lane where the hedgehogs lived, the lane sloped down into the peaty waters of a stream. Fifty years or more ago, clay had been mined from a shelf of land known as the Waste, which stretched along the banks of the stream to the foothills of Dartmoor. Over the years, the workings filled with water and formed a long, narrow lake. This lake was very deep and it was full of huge eels. On sunny afternoons, trench, tench could be seen basking on the surface of the water and pike lay in the shadows of the overhanging blackberry bushes. Foxes and badgers lived in the overgrown clay dump at the edge of the stream. And a family of otters had made its home or halt in the hollow tree at the water's edge. The winter floods had carried down seed capsules of balsam from the moor and the banks of the stream were now screened by a thick growth of these plants. In the heat of the afternoon, the cloying scent of their flowers attracted swarms of bees and at nightfall the place was alive with moths. Part of the waste had been fenced off as a meadow and the little hedgehogs liked to wander over searching under dried cow pats for the fat white maggots which lived there. They liked the warm sweet scent of the cows and sometimes in the early hours of the morning they could lick up a few drops of milk which had oozed from the overflow udder of one of the sleeping animals. The little hedgehogs were terrified of Playboy, the big shy horse that grazed in his meadow Sometimes, irritated by the prickly little animals, he would lash out at them with a great hoof as they ran between his feet. On dewy evenings, they found young frogs in the grass beside the lake, and there were usually pieces of bread and small fish, left behind by the anglers who came there during the day. The old boar was very fond of frogs and fish, but he did not go to the waste very often. 
Even in his fearless old age, the scent of the fox and the badger alarmed him. He had found too many of his kind split open with their skin emptied of flesh. The fox, the badger and the Alsatian dog are the only animals against which the hedgehog's armour of prickles is useless. All three will bite through the curled up urchin and gorge themselves on the succulent flesh of its body. As the summer progressed, the old boar grew tired of his diet, bread and milk. He found fewer and fewer slugs and snails in the gardens where he hunted, and his stomach cried out for meat. His mouth watered at the memory of a young rabbit that he had found in a snare on the waste a year or so before. One evening in August, when the moon was full, he set off for the waste, followed by one sow and the two and her two young Quill and Matty. They were excited by the unfamiliar scents as they gambled along, teasing the older hedgehogs unmercifully. They ran through the long grass at the edge of the lake, pouncing on grasshoppers and frogs. It was Maddy who, rooting under a large stone, disturbed a snake with a black V on its head, an adder, which had spent the day catching gnats and swimming in the cool waters of the lake. At dusk, it curled up in the shelter of the stone which the sun had warmed during the day. The sleeping adder was annoyed at being disturbed by Matty, who had never before seen anything like it, and sprung back in terror as it uncurled. The old boar pounced on the snake and bit into its sides, curling itself up in the same motion. As the adder struck at him, the sow darted in and bit its tail. It struck at the hedgehog again and again, but its venom wasted itself harmlessly on its bristles. Soon the reptile was exhausted and its poison snack sacks empty and its throat terribly torn by the old boar's bristles. It tried to sliver away, but both the adult hedgehog uncurled and attacked it savagely. They tore the flesh from its still living carcass while Matty bit fiercely at his tail. The boar chased Quill away when he tried to join in the feast. Read some more soon. Bye.